the moors so this is probably well, definitely one of my favorite um, eras or empires to talk about when it comes to um, African civilization and African history. Partly because they contribute so much internationally, so they contribute so much to our way of life in Britain and Western Europe as a whole. And their empire spans all the way from the end of the sorry, the yeah, the end of the Dark Ages. We're going to talk about why that is in Europe all the way up to the Renaissance. We're going to talk about why that is as well in Western Europe. The Renaissance basically was uh, an era of enlightenment for Western Europe where we essentially went from living in squalor to start to lay down the foundations to live far more pri privileged lives um, all the way up until I suppose the end of empire and then arguably beyond beyond that as well. So the Moors, the, the Middle Ages, from 700 to 1492, if you would have had the pleasure of visiting southern Spain, you would have heard um, a prayer being called in Arabic, um, calling Muslims of African, Arabic and Spanish descent to pray in the great mosques of the time in southern Spain. You would have smelt the sweetest perfumes and seen elaborate garments. You may have had the pleasure of being one of the first people in Europe to snack on a pomegranate or drink coffee uh, before being served a three course meal, starter, main and dessert, all which were uh, brought into Europe via the Moors from North Africa. The sound of the oud, which is the predecessor of the guitar, would be heard um, in the city centres. You may have stayed in a riad with a central garden, a stone building in absolute mathematical precision. It was built in absolute mathematical precision rather than out of wooden barns, which were common in the rest of Europe at the time. All of these pleasures and more were brought to Europe thanks to the Moors of North Africa. Imagine Muslim international traders, the world's best scientists, mathematicians, elaborate riches and sophisticated dining practices, and you have the Moors. Testimonies to their presence features in many African, Arabic and European towns, as well as our language. Words with the prefix al, such as algebra, alcohol, alchemy, um, alkaline and cipher entered into our European languages. Even words such as checkmate, influenza, typhoon, orange and cable can be traced back to Arabic origins as they made their way into European language whilst the Moors occupied uh, southern Spain until the Spanish Reconquista, which lasted from 711 to 1492. The Spanish Reconquista was the... So as you'd call them Christian Spaniards, because there were Muslim Spaniards as well, but this, the Spanish Reconquista is the time in which the Christian Spaniards were trying to push the Moors back out of Spain. The Moors were also responsible for introducing coffee and lemons into Europe, as well as refining architecture with mathematical precision, as I've just previously mentioned. Now, this section of the Moors is heavily influenced by the work of African historian Robin Walker and his book titled When We Ruled and the documentary When the Moors uh, Ruled All Europe by Bethany Hughes. Bethany Hughes. Now, by 500 AD, the Holy Roman Empire was in decline, giving rise to what we call the Dark Ages. The Roman Empire had imploded and minor factions were now fighting for power. This was an era in Europe of which little was written, chaos was rife and tribal warfare was very common. Because nothing was written, we therefore call it the Dark Ages because there's no um, enlightenment of what, of what happened or what went on. But this is only true in some areas of Europe, obviously in southern Spain, which was ruled by the Moors, who boasted high levels of literacy, a lot was written. Now, Robert Brifort, a keen student of, de of development of culture, wrote the following commentary on this part of world history. Europe lay sunk in a night of barbarism, more awful and horrible than of the primitive savage. For it was the decomposing body of what had been a great civilization, i.e. Rome, cities had practically disappeared. The remains of the population dwelt in huts, built among the ruins of the amphitheatre. 
Famines and plagues were chronic. Cases of cannibalism were not uncommon. There were manhunts, not with a view to plunder, but for food. It is on record that at uh, Taunus on the Somme, human flesh was publicly put up for sale. For the, from the breakdown of order under Roman Empire, we had an implosion of society giving rise to chaos. It would be the equivalent of Parliament collapsing. However, the Dark Ages were an isolated event from the rest of the world. As Europe was tearing itself to pieces, a new empire had formed. The Moorish Empire was enjoying a golden age of Islamic civilization. Now, we can't speak about the Moors without, without speaking about Islam. In 610 AD, the prophet Muhammad claimed to have been greeted by the angel Great Gabriel. The life of the prophet Muhammad and his message was written into what we now know as the Quran. At the time of Muhammad, many pagan religions had formed, but none had gained the popularity of Islam, which is today the, sec the world's second largest religion, second only to Christianity. However, Islam arguably boasts the largest actively practicing followers. So, for example, there are more Muslims that practice in a mosque than there are Christians who practice in a church. Islam's popularity is partly due to the genius of early followers who created a Muslim settlement called Medina. Rather than staying as a nomadic religion, they settled and built an infrastructure around them. This provided an urban base for Islam to sprout which, from which allowed control and uniformed practice, i.e. everyone was practicing in the same way. At the time, raids between territories were commonplace. Tribes may raid neighbouring neighbourhoods or, or sorry, neighbouring tribes for supplies, cattle, and even just for hierarchy, i.e. to gain status. However, these raids progressively took on a religious flavour, demonstrating the might of Islam or the will that Allah has bestowed upon his loyal followers. One quote from the time is, you are Arab chiefs, denounce this world and God will give you this world and the hereafter. Within decades, Islamic rule spanned from Persia to North Africa, covering two continents and soon to be three. The Prophet Muhammad instructed his followers to seek knowledge. This had a huge effect on the followers of Islam. Whereas historic, historically, literally, as, as historically, whereas historically, literacy rates were kept low to ensure a controlled economic structure throughout Europe and Asia, Islam encouraged learning of Arabic, firstly to enable Muslims to read the Quran, and secondly to enable them to pursue an education. So they were actively trying to empower the public to become more educated, which is quite different to what we see in other areas of Europe at the time. Religion and the study of the arts and sciences was therefore combined. Madrasas, i.e. schools, were built besides mosques to allow prayer and study to occur in, within the same vicinity. These madrasas were built throughout North Africa and Islamic influence therefore expanded. Later, we had the Arab expansion across North Africa. Now, due to the heat of the desert, the Arabs travelled at night when the temperature dropped, um, sometimes to below freezing. But to, get, to navigate at night, they had to learn to read the stars. Because obviously, at night, there was no electricity, they couldn't see any hills but the stars, so therefore they had to learn to read the stars to navigate um, themselves when they were travelling. This developed into astronomy, the study of the stars, the moons and the planets. Advanced mathematical systems had to also be developed to use the stars for navigation, but also for religious reasons. Muslims prayed towards Mecca. As Islam moved throughout northern Africa, Muslims needed to accurately calculate the position of Mecca, for which they used the stars. They also used further mathematics to time religious festivals which were coordinated with the lunar calendar. 
As instructed by their prophet Muhammad, who told his followers to seek knowledge, the Muslims were aggressive readers and absorbed knowledge from every civilization they came across. As the Muslims progressed throughout North Africa, they started to convert and mix with the native populations to quickly resemble the people who we now refer to as the Moors. This is how a mixed empire, i.e. a mix between Arabs and Africans, started to develop. And it's also interesting to, to look at it like this because it, for some people that might be a, a bit of a shock that two different ethnicities of people um, combined under one religion. But we have to then reflect on the way that we see people in, say, Britain. Um, in Britain, we might class people as race first, then gender, and then you might say class, i.e. how much money they have and, and things like that. It's how we judge people, right? But that's actually been inherited probably from our feudal system. When we look elsewhere onto other areas of the planet, especially in, say, Northern Africa or some areas of the Middle East, they would prioritise religion first, just like the ancient Romans prioritised um, imperialism first. Are you Roman or are you non-Roman? Are you Roman or are you a savage? Are you Muslim? Are you Christian? Are you Jewish? Before even getting to race, it's just how different organisations, different empires um, structured their, their, their social systems. When the advancing Muslim armies conquered Alexandria, Egypt, um, in, in Egypt, they stumbled across a gold mine. The Great Alexandria Library, which was built during the reign of the Ptolemaic uh, uh, pharaohs of ancient Egypt and 3rd century BC, contained the Greek classics. The Moors absorbed the classics, the Greek classics, into their empire and into their understanding and into their education, progressing the works with their own input. They translated key works such as the Greek classics and the Bible into Arabic. The Berbers of North Africa, i.e. present-day Morocco, were the next to convert to Islam on eighth, on, in, in, within, in the 8th century. Morocco, a mere nine miles from Spain, provided an access point into Europe. Meanwhile in Spain, King Roderick, a Visigoth Germanic leader, had conquered the native Spaniards and held control over them with an iron fist. However, Count Julian of Ceuta, an, an ally of King Roderick, had sent his daughter to stay with King Roderick for education in Toledo. To Count Julian's fury, um, King or to, 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 to Count Julian's fury, King Roderick took advantage of Count Julian's daughter and impregnated her. In vengeance, Count Julian recalled his daughter. He revealed the vulnerable areas of King Roderick's defence to Musa ibn Nasir, the governor of the Moorish army, who was stationed nine miles in Africa. This is his way of getting his, his own back. Now, in 710 AD, Governor Musa ibn Nasir instructed General Tarif to invade the coast of Spain with 500 troops. They attacked the coastline which had been flagged as vulnerable by Count Julian. The troops landed at a small port and were quickly victorious in their campaign. The, to, in Tarif's honour, the port was named after him, Tarifa. The Moors added a tax to all who wanted to use the port Tarifa. And this is what came to be known as a tariff, a term in which we still use to this to today to describe a tax. A year later, in 711 AD, another invasion would follow. Tariq ibn Zayed, governor of Mauritania, uh, landed with 6,700 African soldiers and quickly built a fort in Mons Kalp. Once again, the area was named in Tariq's honour, Jebel Tariq meaning Rock of Tariq, which is now called Gibraltar. Much like the Romans 700 years before them, the Moors didn't have to rely on violence to conquer. Impressed by the structure, culture and wealth of the Moors, many Spaniards flocked to Tariq's allegiance to fight the Visigoth rulers. On their arrival, the Moors found many cities in despair under Visigoth rule. Many Spaniards may have struck truces with the Moors in exchange for protection against the Visigoths. Tariq's power grew, and in the summer of 711 AD, he marched his forces to face the Visigoth King Roderick himself. His army was 14,000 strong against King Roderick's 60,000 strong army. However, 
Tariq was victorious within an hour. A quote from the Times says, The Moors' horses were fire, their faces black as pitch. The Goths were broken in an hour. That was written by a European writer at the time. Later, in 712 AD, Musa ibn Nasir mobilised 18,000 Arabs and Africans and seized Carmona, Cremona, Medina and Sidona. After being chased down by Tariq's army, King Roderick was killed in battle in 713 AD.